Um, so just kind of back to SNL, because you said these uh, the hosts would have to trust the writing process. Um, how much would there be ad-libbing on the show? Because it is a live show and sometimes people mess up. Was there a whole lot of that or was it um, like, was that kind of forbidden? Yeah. Radically. Not as much as the regular viewing audience thinks, mm-hmm. but there are some people who did it better than others. Eddie Murphy, he didn't ad lib a lot, but he had the capacity to ad lib if a sketch was going in the tank. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember once Don Rickles hosted the show and he ad libbed so much that we had to cut two sketches, uh, during the live show (laughs) because it was running so long, but, um, mostly they, they do what's on the, on the script. People think that it's all, I can't tell you how many people have come up to me and say, and said, uh, well, you wrote for Saturday night live. What does that mean? Did you, did you write what they said? Like, well, of course we did. That's the job. <laughs> what do you think? Well, they make this stuff up. But people actually do believe that the cast makes up the lines as they're going along. So would you ever just see like a script you wrote just be absolutely gone off the rails by the end of it? And how does that feel as a writer if you just see the total abandonment yes. of what you've yes. written? Um, we, so we wrote a series I, when I... In my second year, I was working with a couple of other guys, and we wrote a series of scripts, excuse me, a series of sketches called First Draft Theater. And the idea was the first drafts of really famous dramatic or comedic Mm -hmm. pieces and how bad the first draft was in comparison to what the finished (laughs) product was. So, you know, there would be writer flubs in the middle or really really, uh, stale dialogue and stuff. So the first one that we wrote was uh, based on The Big Sleep, a Raymond Chandler novel. And that worked really well. And then we wrote a second one um, based on 12 Angry Men. And that played really well. So the producers wanted a third. So we wrote the first draft of the Bible. And the sketch was supposed (laughs) to be, you know, hearing, again, the first draft of God as he's composing the Bible. Well, one of the actors in the show by then was a guy named Christopher Guest. Mm -hmm. And he was doing the voice of God and he was in the narration booth. Well, uh, if you've ever seen somebody who's doing off-camera voice narration, they usually, they read the script page, and when they're done with a page, they throw it over their shoulder behind them and just read the next one. Well, Chris was doing that, but a couple of pages stuck together, and he threw the ball (laughs) over his shoulder and got lost. (laughs) And now, I didn't know this at the time. I found out later that's what happened. What I know is I'm in the back of the theater watching the sketch play, And all of a sudden, there's silence. And it went on for 11 seconds. Now, I've gone back and counted it watching the tape. But in the moment, it felt like 30 to 45 seconds. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And everybody's going, what's going on? What's going on? And the actors are looking around because they didn't know what to do because God's supposed to be speaking and nothing's coming over the sound system. And then, you know, we see this guy that I told you we worked for, Dick Ebersole, running under the bleaches, yelling, he lost his script. He lost his script. (laughs) <laughs> and he was running to give him another copy. Well, finally they got it back. But like in that 11 seconds, believe me, my heart must heart, have stopped yeah. two or three times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 11 seconds in show business feels like an eternity. And I'll tell you another one. This happened on that show Fridays that I mentioned to you. Mm-hmm. Um, I wrote a sketch back then. Star Wars was just coming into vogue. I think the second Star Wars movie had come out. And... Woody Allen had released a movie called um, Stardust Memories. And so I thought it would be funny to combine those two premises. And we had a guy who did a really good Woody Allen impression in the cast. So I wrote a sketch called Star War Memories or Star Wars Memories. And the idea was Woody Allen against Darth Vader. That's the basic premise. (laughs) Well, the guy placing playing Darth Vader was Michael Richards, who, of course, you remember from the Seinfeld show. This was back before he was famous. But during the sketch, he's in the whole Darth Vader costume, and there's, uh, you know, the whole thing going on with Woody Allen, and there's lightsaber fighting and everything. And toward the end of the sketch, Woody uh, gets a lightsaber away from someone else, and he turns on Vader, and Vader is supposed to make his escape. Well, Michael made a hand gesture, like, you win this one, and he made a big hand gesture, and he knocked off the Darth Vader helmet. (laughs) So he's standing there on camera with his face... (laughs) his whole head exposed and he didn't know what to do and he just started vamping 
And then he just ran off stage and another <laughs> actor uh, followed him who wasn't even supposed to leave the sketch. And again, the audience didn't even know. They were laughing because they thought that was part of the sketch. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I'm sitting there pulling out my hair. <laughs> But, you know, it's live TV, and that's what made, makes live TV great. No, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Oh, Michael Richards, man. Must have been someone to see him do his stuff for that show. It was, and I got to, to write a couple of pieces for Michael. I even went over to his house one time and helped co-write a piece with him. Uh, really intense guy, really nice guy, and a brilliant comedic mind. Mm -hmm. he, uh, yeah, because the way he can integrate it into acting, and it's just... Because I know his writing mind is, uh, not writing, but like it's just his mind comedically is great. But I just know right. through Seinfeld, obviously, like the way he would act and just make a movement part of the joke. And he was just great at it. But um, I'll tell you a story about the Seinfeld show. Larry David is a, is a family friend of mine. He was actually my brother's best friend in their early days of stand-up comics. So he was into my house and around, and I was exposed to him a lot. So when he started doing Seinfeld... I ran into him at the improv in Los Angeles and they had just done four episodes wow. and I had seen the four episodes and the network was considering whether to, to pick it up for more. And I, you know, I sat down at a table and I told him how much I liked it. And he goes to me, really? You don't think Michael's too big? You don't think too big meaning, you know, over the top. Right, right, right. He said, you don't, he was really questioning whether that character worked. Wow. And I said, oh, I think he's really funny. <laughs> <laughs> and of no course, way. not because Ridiculous. of me, but they kept doing it, and it, and it. But but Larry's initial instinct was that that character wasn't working. Just too over the top. Yeah, he I, thought it was too wild wow. and silly. Yeah. Because I heard, I mean, what do I know? But I just saw some, like, interview of some sort, um, and Jerry was saying that the second he saw Michael Richards in that first audition, he was like, "Yeah, that's our guy." Yeah, they, they were sold on Michael, and, and Larry knew Michael from Fridays many years earlier. But once they got on the stage, you know, it became what we now know to be a great ensemble. Mm -hmm. But in the early moments, you don't know whether it's clicking or not. Jerry was very dry, and he, was, he didn't have really any acting chops to start. And they only brought Julia in, I think, two or three episodes in, because the network had said, you need a female presence there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but the the original show was just supposed to be Jerry the and the guys. George character, or, with a with a couple of other people that came in for a little bit of color. Hmm. The idea of making a four person ensemble that just developed. Wow, that's crazy. That is nice. Yeah. That is crazy. So, speaking of Julia Louis Dreyfus, she yeah. I I love her. She's amazing, mm -hmm. and she was on SNL during the time you were there. Yep. Just talk, like before we move on to your other stuff, just to talk about some celebrities that you worked with. Um, like, what was it like working with like her, Eddie um, Murphy? Eddie Murphy. He has some writing credits on some episodes during your time there. Like, are you, were you guys ever in a room together working on stuff? Uh, well, first of all, let's talk about Julia. She had come to the show a year or two before me. She was wonderful. We were all young back then. Um, you know, I don't think that we utilized her as well as we could have. The writing staff adored her, and we knew she was really talented. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's hard to figure out how to how to uh, you know showcase that talent in a sketch comedy show, especially when you have bigger names that you're supposed to be servicing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she got relegated to a lot of bit parts or you know um, weekend update style in ones where we should have been really. Have her as a main advantage of her, her, her talents more, but she was wonderful. She was great. Um, I loved writing for her. Eddie, uh, I was, you know, I, first of all, yes, you're in the room with all of them at some point. I mean, that's the nature of the show. We never actually sat down and wrote a sketch together, but I wrote several sketches for him. I wrote a couple of Mr. Robinson's neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. I wrote a couple of buckwheat pieces. Um, I wrote some sketches that were just premise sketches where he played a character and we had, I mean, we were pals. I didn't go out hanging out with him, but we had a good relationship. He was very kind to me. Um, he once did me a solid, uh, about a year after he had left the show, <clears throat> I was back in Los Angeles at the improv cause that's where I was all the time. <laughs> and he came in and 
he was with like an entourage of people and everybody's looking, you know, oh, there's Eddie Murphy, there's Eddie Murphy. It was like a big deal. And the people at the table that I was sitting at were saying, hey, you should go over and say hi to him. And I'm thinking like, I'm not even sure he knows my name. I'm not going over there <laughs> and saying hi to this guy. So they're all going, yeah, hey, don't go over. In the meantime, he had gone upstairs to, they had this like little VP lounge, upstairs, VIP lounge. And we see him coming back down the stairs. And I watch Eddie as he walks across the room and every eye in the improv, you know, not in the club because the club had a show going on, but in the bar area, every eye was on Eddie Murphy. He comes down the stairs, walks straight to the table I was at and says hi to me and asks me how I'm doing. Now, he didn't have to do that. You must have but felt I thought like a that million was a bucks. really nice thing to do. <laughs> After he left, I would just be like, yeah, you saw everyone. Exactly. Like, everyone That's saw exactly that, right? Everyone, yeah. You, yeah. Hey, this guy. I go to him. He came to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Eddie? Oh, we go way back, man. You don't even know. <laughs> Wait, do you guys know that guy? <laughs> um, what, what has changed in your creative process over the course of your career? I can't stay up as late. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, that is a terrific question that I don't know that I've ever been asked quite so directly. So let me try to give you a really good answer. I think I'm a better writer now than I was back then, um, but I'm also more discerning. I don't sit down to write something unless I feel really confident that it's a good premise and I know where I'm going with it. So I'm much more choosy about what I write now. Mm -hmm. But I do think that like anything else in the world, you know, until you, you get senile and I'm not far from that, <laughs> but until you get senile, you only get better. And unfortunately, as you probably know, the entertainment uh, industry doesn't necessarily revere that mm -hmm. they would prefer younger, newer, fresher. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, I think a lot of really good talent gets lost in those years when you're not the new flavor of the month. But um, my process is more confident and more discerning. So it's definitely more more uh, a quality over quantity now, whereas probably back then you're just writing as much as you can to see what works. And now it's like, I know this is going to work, so I'm going to put time into this compared exactly. to Exactly. Rather yes. than do 50 half-assed jobs, do 25 or even 10 just really good ones that you are very confident in. Right, right. 